I'm thinking inside, te gusta? Do you like it? Do you like what you see? Because here I am, all this gorgeousness and all of this that I believe that I am so worthy. And that self-worth is what makes it so attractive and so beautiful because it's so elegant rather than being vulgar. And then seduction turns into something completely different. You say, I'm going to quote you, I really believe that seduction leads to self-confidence and self-confidence leads to success in all areas of your life. Master seduction and you can have anything you want. So if you don't mind actually that, yeah, explaining the, the word seduction. I think what intrigues so much about seduction is that on one hand, it's a life force. It really wakens up our ability to attract. And I mean, not just seduction in a sense of sexual seduction, but also in business. Business is a seduction when you want to lure someone into negotiations and sales and marketing, that's seduction as well. So to master that is not as where everybody goes like, oh, master seduction, do I need to sleep with somebody? But to master seduction is actually to master a confidence and elegance, the ability to attract, to wake up desire on the other side for what you're offering to like to wake up to something that is bigger than what we know about it. Seduction is so much bigger than what we've seen around. When we think of seduction, we have a cultural context to it. So if you go, for example, to Latin America and you start to talk about seduction, eh, no big deal. But if you come to North America, especially the United States and Canada, where you use words like PDA, which is to shame about showing affection in public, mm -hmm. then suddenly seduction can be perceived as something negative. Not only that, but a lot of people and many that have not traveled outside of the, their own country, what have they been exposed to? Commercials where women are licking um, <laughs> ice cream, pops, yeah. <laughs> right? Then you have things like pickup artists and someone is teaching them how to manipulate in order to get something out, and they call that the art of seduction. But that's not true seduction. When, you know, what I've learned in Cuba from 15 years of studying seduction through the body by learning how to embody it and how to feel it and how to express it, is that when you're seducing someone, you're actually leaving them full and better off than before. You're not taking something, you're giving something, which is something entirely different. And not only that, but at the core of it is such high self-worth and pride of who you are. Here's to give you a little example, right? Like if I wanna attract somebody to me, then there might be a guy here and I'd be looking at, and this look of seduction the reason that it's so seductive is because I'm thinking inside, te gusta, do you like it? Now, when I think te gusta, do you like it? It's not, do you like it like meat? Like, do you like what you see? Do you want to have it? Do you want, it's nothing like that. Do you like what you see? Because here I am, all this gorgeousness and all of this that I believe that I am so worthy. Do you like it? And that self-worth is what makes it so so attractive and so beautiful because it's so elegant rather than being vulgar. And then seduction turns into something completely different. So you actually just said self-worth. I'm sure everyone right now just literally stopped. Like, hang on a minute. How do you put seduction and self-worth together? Mm -hmm. The other words that you use are charm, connection, vulnerability, pride, confidence, appeal. So knowing all of these words, if someone listening right now wants to build their self-worth, wants to become confident, wants to be open, but also have the appeal, because let's not pretend that isn't actually something that makes you feel good. How, what are the steps someone can take right now in order to do that, which whether you say it's seduction or confidence? So let's start with the fact that everything that you just said about those words is about being a whole person, like really being whole. And anything that's not sitting right would not allow you to seduce. So what do I mean by that? Um, for example, one of the things that I discovered when I studied so much about seduction is that at the core of the people that were the most seductive, they had rejection resilience. Rejection resilience is the ability to go like, you're kind of coming towards someone and you're doing something seductive and someone says no and you come again and you come again and you come again and you do it in a way that just kind of softens the heart and eventually that turns into a maybe and that turns into a yes 
So <laughs> let me give you some seduction tips. So I'm going to give one for men and one for women just to kind of see what we can do yeah. with it. So oh, for... actually, that's super interesting. Before you go into that, let's. Mm -hmm. what, um, are there different strategies then for a woman to seduce somebody and a man to seduce? Of course, because we have a different energy. So let's start with the fact that every man and every woman, um, each person has both feminine and masculine energies. And the mix that we have is very different from personality to personality. Like you, for example, you're very feminine, but you're tomboyish, mm. right? Mm. And you're very strong, but you have that femininity at the same time. I'm very different flavor than you. I'm very strong as well, but I've got that extra seduction and yeah, stuff. Yeah, right now your eyebrows gone off. You're giving me a bit of the sexy look, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we each have our own flavor. In in Spanish, they call it sabor, mm. flavor, because mm. it's almost like we're ice creams, and each one of us has a different flavor. And it's about discovering your flavor. So men and women are different in their strategies because. Uh, I mean, think about it like this. It's a little bit more like traditional relationships. A woman wants to, when she wants to be seduced, she wants the man to also instill confidence in her. So a man who knows how to seduce a woman but instill confidence kind of creates that sense of a little bit of that sense of security in what he's giving inside of that seduction is different than a bad boy. And then a woman traditionally wants to make the man chase her. Of course, these these games or these seduction games and, and the way to attract is also changing in the in the in the modern world, mm. right? Because a woman can go after a man and a man could go after a woman. There's like there's a breakdown of some of these things. But at the same time, show me a woman who doesn't like to be treated by a man and kind of pampered um, if she hasn't lost touch with her feminine side. If she lost touch with her feminine side, she might take over completely and not let the guy mm. at all lead. Men feel very masculine when they can lead a woman. And to say, let the man lead, doesn't mean now he has to take over life and he's now the boss and you're now serving him. But let him open the door. Let him go and organize the night for you and, and pamper you and wine you and dine you. Let him be the guy. You can be, you can lead in, like certain nights, he can lead certain nights, but you don't have to take over completely all the time by being a strong person. And at the same time, you get to rest because he's now doing it. Mm. <laughs> so that's really nice and you feel good. And I love the way you put that because it's not giving your power over. And I think that that's where when we're talking about the art of seduction, so many of us feel like if I am seduced, it means I don't have the willpower. I don't have the control. I don't have the ability to own my own life. And if I'm seducing someone, then I'm taking the power away from them. But if the art of seduction is a tool that us women can use to take our power, to really be able to go, I want this, how do I go after it with confidence? I really want to supply them with the tools that they, so they can actually use them. Mm -hmm. And in everything we're about to talk about, the power that you're really teaching us right now, now allows women to feel more confident to take that step. So thank you. More confident. And it is all about that elegance and that pride in yourself. I get a lot of what I want. And it's not in a sexual way. And that's important to point out. So let me give you something juicy. So, um, and it's something that I teach a whole thing in a course inside of our Somatic Intelligence Wisdom Academy, like how to actually do it. But I'm gonna give you a little thing here. So let me sed seduce. I'm gonna, uh, you know, I'm personally not attracted to women, so I'm gonna imagine a really hot guy over there. And um, all right, so, here we go. And I'm going to break it down afterwards. I'm going to first show it to you. So. All right. So that what, did, amazing. <laughs> what did we have here? So there's so many different parts, but I'm just going to give a couple of yeah. tips. One starts with that elegance. So. I'm sitting in my elegance and I'm feeling good about myself and my self-worth is here. My pride is here. Pride in who I am, pride in what I've achieved in my life, pride for even creating that kind of a method that never existed in the world. And that's at the core of that self-worth mm. that lets me sit here and feel great about myself. And that doesn't make me better than anybody else. And why am I saying this? Because in almost every culture, there's a damage where Past generations were so afraid that people are going to become arrogant mm. that they've confused arrogance with pride. Arrogance is when you're thinking now all of this that I've achieved makes me better than you. 
and now I'm arrogant. But pride is just feeling good about this and it doesn't make me any better than you, but what it does give me are emotional anchors. You know, that TED talk that you talked about, I left a life of 17 years and restarted again because I wanted to be close to my dad. And I moved myself to the other side of the planet to be close to him. And I know that's close to your heart because you're very close to your mom. And I was just like, I got to be there. I'm not getting the important moments in my life to create those life stories together. And it's been two decades and I need this decade now. So I moved away and I had to start all over again. And it was so hard. I was crying every day, but I never regretted it. It was just tough. I had to like, I had a reputation. I had a TED talk. I was a best-selling author. I was this stuff. I had to start over again and meant nothing where I went. So that was my anchor. Every time I felt down, I would put that TED talk on. I would go like, you did it again. Do it again, girl. No one forced you. You made that choice. So I did it again. But that anchor is something that no one can take away from you because you've already achieved it. It doesn't matter where you are now. Some people go like, yeah, but I'm not there now. So what does it matter? It does because you've already earned it. That gives you something to hold on to. That's an emotional anchor. And that's where you see that pride come in with that amazing confidence. I stick anchors all over the place. So now I've got my confidence. And just to kind of break it down a little more, like, so you're using a lot of your body language, right, in order to exude that. So even with the way you're sitting, you've got your shoulders back, you've even got your, your neck almost elongated, I noticed. Right. Um, and like the way that you're sitting with your legs crossed, but you seem very certain with your hands that are it's intertwined. It's elegant. It's not vulgar. Yeah. It feels very beautiful and yet soft and feminine. What I'm doing is, you're absolutely right, I'm alligating my back every vertebra super long as if someone pulled me right from mm -hmm, here. Mm -hmm. And then allowing my chest to pop open. And, and then that, that's actually, it's really important to say, that's a power pose that mm -hmm. changes the chemistry in your body in two minutes. So as mm -hmm. soon if I'm sitting here, I'm not feeling, and there's nothing wrong with that yeah, as well. Yeah, like we no, can also sit course. with that, not to say we always have to sit, but definitely when I'm in seduction, it's not the same here as when I'm sitting here. Yeah, I would never just be like, I'm seducing you right now. Like, <laughs> exactly, I'm just like lean back. Right? I feel like I'm just like chilling on the couch. Exactly. A hundred percent. And the reason why I want to emphasize as we go along, it's the little things that people now may dismiss. It's like, okay, she's sitting up straight. I've heard that before. No, 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 no. Pause. Pause right now. Right. Sit up straight. As if the, I love the invisible string, because now with everything you're going to take us through, it all, for that groundedness, you need that groundedness. Mm -hmm. So the way that you're sitting already exudes it. Right. So then to begin with, someone sees you like this and you're just sitting somewhere, whether that's your husband that you want to seduce, whether you're in a bar, it doesn't matter. And you're sitting there and that's the beginning of it. Now, here's a little trick. You ready? And you just winked at me. Was that on purpose? Yes. Ah, <laughs> I know this your seduction <laughs> movement. <laughs> so, that, was, good. that was good, girl. <laughs> that was good that you caught it. So now I'm going to give you that little trick. So notice this. This is this is me seducing. Yeah. And notice this. Hmm. What did I do? I created with my body a little bit of a no. And in that no, when I'm giving you that yes, there's a no and there's a yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if I'm sitting towards you, there's a yes in the body. And then when I'm looking at you, it's too much yes. So if I'm here now and I'm looking at you, oh. see that? Little tricks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, I mean, that is such a small nuance. I never mm. would have realized. Mm. So the, the seducing is little by little. And so you want to do a bit of a yes and a no. So for it to be very seductive, I'll give you a different image. So in my country, you come to a little market and you might know this from Cyprus and there's like a watermelon. And it's the season and you don't know, it's just started and you don't know if you want to buy the watermelon. Is it sweet or not? Mm -hmm. Because if not, it's a whole watermelon. You're going to throw it out. So you go like, well, I don't know if it's sweet. And the guy will take a knife and it will slice us at that, like it'll give you one. And you taste it, you're like, oh my God, I'm taking the whole thing. That's seduction. Because he just seduced you with a little bit, making you want more by giving you just enough, not giving too much to the point that you sell, take the whole thing. That's seduction. So when we're seducing any kind of seduction, I'm giving just enough, not giving too much. If I'm giving too much, I give it all. Mm -hmm. But instead, if I'm giving you just enough, now you want the rest and then I take it away. 
It's so good. <laughs> okay, so okay, okay, keep going. I love this. Another little trick that's really important is relaxing the jaw. A lot of people, when they get started, you'll see them going like this. <laughs> and they're so terrified and the lips are tight and everything's tight. And I mean, you could be practicing for 15 hours. You still got to make it look like, oh, that little thing I do when I wake up. Mm. That's part of the whole thing is that it's got to look easy. Yeah. Let's actually take a real uh, scenario, if you will. If you're trying to get a partner, Mm -hmm. I can understand how that, it feels very obvious from the surface, right? You're flirting. Mm -hmm. In fact, is there a difference between flirting and seduction? Well, I think that seduction doesn't have to be flirting. Even when we're talking about um, seduction in business, right? If I want a negotiation, it doesn't need to be, but there is a flirtiness to it in the sense of wanting to attract and uh, like a game, but not necessarily flirting in the sense of like sexual flirting. Okay, so let's actually break that down because my mind automatically does go to the, the sexual part of it. Mm -hmm. um, and so in business, how do you take out the sexual part of it? Like it's not, so it's not misconstrued. So let's start with, with a good example, trailers to movies. That's seduction, mm -hmm. it's not sexual could be a trailer about something super sad and a dramatic thing and people are dying or sad like but what they're doing is that they're giving you just enough mm. creating a desire for the rest of it like hiding the best parts but just giving you enough that you want to know what happened there that's seduction mm. it's the same in anything in business when you take the concept of it and you know how to feel it in your body then you learn to create those right like a good example would be in marketing and you know you're going like oh my god in a couple of days something's coming up and then you go like in, in three days, in two days, and it's like you're creating that mm -hmm. desire for what's coming up and you're hiding, but you're giving just, and then you'll give a little hint and go like, oh, oh my God, like, and what, what is going on? What is it? What is it? You're creating that desire, that seduction, but it's not sexual. Mm -hmm. There's seduction all around us all the time, but we've, that's exactly the problem is that seduction has become something that we're so stuck on the aspect of sexuality of it that we think seduction always has to be sexual, but it's not, it's all around you all the time. One of the most seductive things that you can do in business is use your personality. And I, I call this social charm. It, social charm because it connects us to other people. So if you think about Oprah or Ellen DeGeneres or JLo, and if you think of like four words that would describe their personality and part of what makes them win, there's like, it's almost like a brand that you can put the four words that describe them. And that's part of the, the magic sauce of what makes it happen. Mm. Not everybody knows how to use their social charm and to tap into it. You're very good at using your social charm, girl. <laughs> what do I do? I don't even realize. You very, uh, one word I would give you, well, you're strong. You're very playful, mm. very authentic. And those definitely three words come to mind right away. I have to think of the fourth and warm, I would probably say, very approachable. So that's part of your charm. So when you come, it's like you want to hug and you want to you play and you want to joke. And it's like this like energy of like, oh, and it's like, as soon as that happens, like, okay, where are we going? What are we doing? Right? Oh, uh, yes. Well, here's a trick question. And where's that fine line between then charm and seduction? Because as you were talking, I was like, oh, yeah, that is part of my charm that I use to seduce people. Charm is seduction, but it's a form of seduction that's non sexual. Mm -hmm. So, you're, see. Wait, so wait, wait, wait. tell me that you don't go to certain meetings and activate that charm when you want to get certain a things. Thousand percent. Hello, you're seducing people with your charm. Yeah. Right. So, okay, I love this because, um, so I do, I start touching into my feminine. Mm. That's exactly what I do. Mm. I go softer, mm. I go sweeter, I go calmer. Uh -huh. Oh, interesting. So actually then, can you be in your masculine and seduce? It depends on your personality, right? The, 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 we're all born with a certain charm. And it's not the same for everybody. One could be very authentic and quiet. Another one could be really cheerful. Another one could be sexy. Like mm. it's that flavor. And we see this in young kids. You know, when young kids, they start to do that thing. And then you look at them and you go, oh my God, I, when they do that, I got to give them whatever they want. <laughs> and they know exactly how to activate that thing. That's the charm. The problem is that a lot of the times today in many cultures, we start to go like, grow up enough. It's, you're not a little boy or a little girl anymore. And then we shut it down for them instead of allowing them. One of the things I love about mm -hmm. all the years I spent in Cuba is that 
they don't shut it down. They let it transform from childhood to adulthood and they're such charmers. You're like, whoo, okay, you get whatever you want. Well, where do I sign the papers for the next deal? <laughs> Yeah, because they because it hasn't been told to them that it's a bad thing to do. Is that right? That's right. Mm. That's right. Which takes us to, I think, talking about what happens to us that shuts down seduction. And I think that's that's one of the things. It's not just seduction. I think it's important to open up the whole conversation about trauma, mm. because we're we're talking about the juicy stuff, about the fun stuff, about where we want to be and what we want to do. But most of the people, when they come in the beginning. And they say, oh, teach me what you did in the TED Talk. And then you start to dive deeper in what goes on inside them and to unpack the root of what's at the root of their foundation. There's some kind of trauma. Mm -hmm. And whether and trauma could be something that happened to you that was big, where you got um, hurt emotionally or someone abandoned you or you were bullied. But it could also be, and this is where people get, don't understand how deep trauma can go. My parents weren't present because they were working all the time. And then you feel like you're not enough. Or it could be something like, my parents expected me to be so great. And they always pushed me to excel. But as a result, I never kind of lived up to that. And I never feel I'm enough. You know, different things. It's not always about enough. But there's different things that happen to us. And do you think that that's where it, it comes from, where um, some people either have been, you know, taught to not use seduction as any means because, you know, they have a certain uh, mind frame about it, but also people that maybe use seduction for bad. And I've heard you say, right, it's like a superpower. It's like, look, it could be used for good. It can be used for evil. It's up to the person. Mm -hmm. So do you think that comes from the childhood, that trauma, so that if somebody has been um, uh, either manipulated themselves, they use that as a manipulation tactic, or if they have just struggled, they don't feel the confidence enough to use it. Most people today are emotionally injured, wounded inside, and, and they don't know how to shift that. So you have to go to the root cause to find what is not working. Mm -hmm. It could be something that has to do with self-worth. It could be something where you've been told your whole life that your nose is too big and as a result you feel ugly. Um, I mean, look, like, just now there was the Sports Illustrated with um, mm. Martha Stewart, right? And Megan Fox was on one of the covers and she just spoke about how uh, she has body dysmorphia and how she's never seen herself as beautiful. Now, there are so many people suffering with that. And how crazy is that, that instead of being able to feel so gorgeous, she is stunning that life has been so damaging mm. and i don't i didn't i don't know her story so i don't know whether that's from home how she was brought up or this is because of the industry she's in and how she was always treated as a as a body that has to be perfect that happens a lot to models by the way i see that a lot when i'm working with models what up homies it's lisa billu and i want to tell you about the easiest way to listen to my podcast women of impact if you're anything like me time is so freaking precious it's the thing you're never going to get back so how on earth do you make the most of it and look for ways to make your life way easier and simpler and so that's where amazon music comes in because listening to women of impact on amazon music is about as easy as it gets you can listen on the app, which is super freaking easy to navigate, or you can just ask my homie Alexa. Alexa, play Women of Impact on Amazon Music. Now playing Women of Impact on Amazon Music. See, it's that simple. And let me tell you, the content is freaking fire. If you're ready, my homie, to be a freaking badass, then listen and follow Women of Impact on Amazon Music. Now, here's what's really important. In the five elements that I teach and the method that I developed, that I extracted from life, from Cuba. So when I started in over 15 years, I was like, what is it that they have here underneath this seduction? What is it that they have, that they embody, that when you see them, you go like, I don't know what it is, but I want what they have. And underneath that seduction, and I really dug a lot deeper, I found five elements. Elegance, which we talked about before, mm -hmm. and that self-worth and that pride. Intention. When you embody intention, you're going towards something like, I'm getting it, get out of the way. Versus, I wanna achieve it and I'm here. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna get there. Versus, I'm gonna get there. My body is now making me feel that I can. Then we have the tempo, 
the tempo is is the rhythm of enjoyment is how we release endorphins and give ourselves permission to enjoy and get ourselves to a natural high and replenish energy and that used to be just from the way we walked because we walked different and we used to release that with a little bounce in the knees for example and then you have the sabrosura and the sabrosura is that sensuality that sits on self-love all these things that i'm talking about trauma for example have hurt our ability to feel the sabrosura. When I tap into the sabrosura, I have to look at every part of my body and go, ooh, these fingers are gorgeous. These hands are gorgeous. It cannot be a go like, I hate these fat sausages and they're ugly. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to laugh, but I know exactly what you mean because I do it to myself. Right. Sadly. Right, but every part of our body when we move has sabrosura. And the sabrosura also mm. releases endorphins in the body and gets us to feel good, for example. So. All of these things that we're doing in society that are destroying that because now there's advertising and now you have to look a certain way and you're being constantly shamed for things and it's hurting our ability to feel self-love, right? Which sits at the core of self-worth. And then the final one is the mystery where seduction and charm live. And all of these together, when we embody them properly, gives us the um, true nature. And true nature is how we were born. So for example, when someone says to me, I lost, I, um, lost my femininity. And that happens a lot to women. They start to chase mm -hmm. careers and they're in, in businesses dominated more by men and they're expected to be tougher and not to show emotions so much. And then there's the whole thing of having kids and, and kind of putting your sexiness aside and being more a mother. And it happens to a lot of women and a lot of women lose their femininity. And then they go like, but I lost it or, or if there was trauma and the mother didn't transfer to you through love. I worked really hard on healing the trauma related to my mom's mental illness and what it did to me. And that took a long time to come out of that journey. I suffered 10 years of suicidal thoughts. I, my boundaries were messed up because my mom didn't constantly cross them out of, and my mom was such a good person. She was a good hearted person. She loved me so much. She wasn't able to give me what was needed because she was manic depressive and her mental illness broke me. And for many years, I didn't talk about this, by the way, I didn't talk about any of what happened here. I was like, let people know just my work. And then you know what changed it? It was really interesting. When I did the TED talk, my team and I, we, um, we sat down and we analyzed at the time all the remarks that were under the TED talk. We were really interested in how people took it and we, we looked at cultural context mm. and everything. It was so interesting. And we categorized it as red, blue, and green. Red, you're a goddess, make me a baby. You're like anything amazing. Yeah. And then, These are comments in the TED comments. talk, yeah. And then the blue is like the haters, like you're a whore, you're promoting rape, like they go to the other extreme. Okay, Reddit, so we took out the red and the, and the, the it's okay, so it comes with the territory of seduction. I knew about that yeah. <laughs> before, I, before I committed to the TED talk. Mm. And then there was the green ones. The green ones were the ones that had insights. They figured out something. And one person wrote underneath and she said, such a shame, she missed it just by a little bit. If she hadn't, she wouldn't have gotten a standing ovation. And I was like, oh, interesting. What did I miss? So I sent her a message. I was like, hi, <laughs> I had to know. Because you needed more information. Hello, with yeah. a remark like that, I had to ask. So I sent her a message and I was like, hi, this is the speaker. And he's like, oh my God, I know you're reading this. this is, and I said, I said, I have to know, what do you think I missed? And she said, well, you're beautiful. You're sexy. You're successful. Of course, seduction will come easy to you. But if only people saw that it was hard for you to get there, like they would, it would have opened such an opening for mm -hmm. them and they would have gotten you a standing ovation. And the first thing that came to mind was like, oh, if you only knew the truth. Yeah. And as soon as I said that to myself, I was like, that's it. The story has got to come out. They don't understand the why, why I'm doing this, why I'm doing this whole work. When you go through 25 years of trying to rebuild, because every time you're building, everything falls apart and you're building and everything falls apart and everything is just a disaster and you're fighting so hard. And I can't even tell you how many people come to me to work with me in coaching or through the academy, the Wisdom Academy. And they start with the sentence, I can't even tell you how many things I've tried and nothing works. And I say, and you think that something's wrong with you, right? And they go, yeah. I go like, no, you just haven't come to the right door. 
So, for example, when someone comes and says to me, their complaint is like, yeah, you know, I'm always in bad relationships and I don't know how to get out of this cycle. And I decided I'm not dating anymore because what's the point? Because it's always going to be the same and I can never have what I want. Then we go to the root cause. What you'll find is that the person was not being received emotionally in certain places. So, for example, let's say you felt something and there was no room for your emotional life. What happens as a result, you start to believe that's not available to me because I'm not being received, not being received because your parent was abusive or could be because your parent wasn't present. But now you think that's not possible for me. So now where do I go? Unavailable men, if I'm in a relationship with men, of yeah. course. So unavailable men, because my parents weren't available, available to me. So I'm always speaking men that are not available to me. So then when you start to be received somatically, when I'm doing somatic coaching, transformational coaching, I have the capacity to feel through my body what you're feeling and then for you to feel me feeling you. And a lot of the times I can feel what you're not feeling that's there that you disconnected from, which, which is where the trauma is. And then we start to come back to these places and restore these places. And as we do that, what happens is that you start to feel received. It's not something that changes through the mind because there are so many people that come to me and go like, I get the whole concept. I get what I'm supposed to do. I get where I'm supposed to get to, but I don't know still how to get there with knowing it mm -hmm. because it doesn't change in the body. So if some people right now is finding themselves in that situation, they really want to be able to uh, build their confidence, be, build their self-worth through understanding what we're talking about, what can that first step be for somebody to, to, to do? Two things I can recommend. One is the Somatic Intelligence Wisdom Academy. And there are programs where you learn the seduction and you learn, like there's a program, for example, called Inside the Emotional Resilience Essentials. You start, for example, with a practice of humming and bringing your energy to the base. And you do that for a month every day, your core will start to shift because what I'm doing is I'm actually shifting the energy when we're feeling overwhelmed. The energy tends to shoot up to the head and to the chest. And then you go, like you're, <laughs> right? The energy becomes here. When you shift the energy, uh, and it kind of lands around pelvic area, mm -hmm. that creates a sense of trust in life. It makes you feel grounded and uh, it, it builds more confidence. So as you move, you learn every day through practices, humming practices and how to shift the energy to the base. Just that practice, like your life will start to shift. The second thing I wanna say is, and here's a thing, not everybody's gonna have access to this because it depends on your life, but at the core of healing, is basically feeling the other person. So a tip I can give everybody who's listening that's very powerful, that can really be life-changing for people. When something happens traumatic, what we really need to be able to pass through something is for someone to be there with us and feel it. When my mom got sick, I was by myself. My mom got sick. I went in the morning to school. I came back in the afternoon. There was no mom. No one set me down and explained. It was like a different time. It wouldn't happen today. But at that time, that seemed normal. And it was like so traumatic. And then my dad was working three jobs at the same time to, to support us. And I was by myself. There was nobody with me to support me. There was no support in school. On the contrary, I was bullied that I'll be crazy like my mom. So now you come and you tell me something, there's a problem. And I go like, well, here's what you should do. That doesn't help you. But if I can sit here with you and you're telling me your story and I can just for a minute go like, what am I feeling with my whole body right now when I'm with you? And I go like, pain. And I can just look at you and go like, I can feel your pain. And even stop you at one minute, go like, let's take a breath here and let's just feel this pain for a minute together. And we can just sit in this pain for a minute and just go. So in that situation, that's so beautiful by the way, so let's say someone's listening right now and they really get what we're saying mm -hmm. and they want to give it a shot because I really urge people to really try these these tips. Would you advise that they get a friend and they say, I just need you to feel my pain? Like, what does that actually look like? Well, one, yes. We can request what we need and can say, hey, can you just be with me and feel this with me? But it's got to be a person who has the capacity. Right, right. I, I won't come to someone who, who's, you know, someone in your life who's always detached, can never feel anything. Like, can you feel this with me? Because it's going to backfire. Mm -hmm. You got to go to someone that can. This is why I'm saying not everybody's going to have that around because maybe in your surrounding, you don't have a person that can do it. Yeah. And you have to kind of ask yourself, is there someone in my life that I can go to and say, can you just feel this with me for a second? Because it's really hard for me to feel this alone. And just go like, let's breathe into that and just be in silence for a minute. Just... 
that's very powerful. That's very healing. Let me give you a good example, a recent example. Everybody was devastated when Twitch took his life. That was just devastating because even his wife didn't see that coming. Like imagine for mental health and what we're talking about, a man who is such a light and he was beautiful and he had a beautiful life and family and kids and, and a soulmate in his life and project. And as she said it lately in, in an interview, he wanted to be everyone's Superman. But in that being a Superman, he never really exposed what he was going through. And men are very susceptible to that because the, a word that comes up when I work with men is the word stoic. Oh. A lot. It's like I, I got to penetrate that stoic and allow them to feel and be vulnerable with me and just be felt and for that to be okay and to get off the being stoic because it's so expected of them. He was being stoic. And when you look now at her and her children, it is admirable because one, she's not rejecting her pain or grief. You can feel it in her, how hard it is. She lost the love of her life in the most devastating way. It's, a tra it's traumatic. But she, she said it in an interview lately. She said, I don't have the privilege to be angry. I think those are the words or something Ooh. close to it. I don't have the privilege to be angry. She knows that she has three children dependent on her and two of them are super young. And she needs to be with them and to have the tough conversations and to feel with them. And as you can see, as she's starting to open their lives again in social media and stuff, you can see that, and she's talking about the fact that it's not easy. It's not like they're not, they're having just good days and everything's great. But you can see that the children are laughing again and they're smiling and they're living life. She's with them feeling and helping them move through that and also allowing herself to move through that rather than repressing it. And there's going to be a lot more to deal with. Like imagine just, you know, maybe one day she'll be ready for another relationship. How do you trust a man that leaves the house after that? When your husband left as if it was okay and then he killed himself, that's another trauma that needs to be healed one day, mm -hmm. right? There's so many layers to this, but she is an incredible and brave woman who's showing the way on how to handle trauma in the most magnificent way. And I'm, I, you know, I'm saying the word magnificent because it takes strength of character to show up, to truly show up for the hard moments and not to run. She's showing up in her pain. Mm -hmm. She's showing up for her children. She's helping them move through it. They will be magnificent people despite that. Wow. And what she's doing is really, so like the feeling part where you get, you're almost sharing that emotion. Is that an echo of being seen? Um, I've interviewed a lot of uh, relationship experts and so many people just like the number one thing that everybody wants in a relationship, whether it's romantic or friendship, is to be seen. And so as you were talking through it, is that a part of it where someone's feeling you? So you just feel like even if the world doesn't see me, even if this is a trauma that lives inside me, there's one person that gets me. I love that you said being seen because it is such a core thing for so many people and it goes much deeper than that. Mm -hmm. It's being felt. <laughs> Seen is just, I mean, it's the word we use, but yeah, what we really yeah. mean if we unpack that is we want to be felt. It's not just being seen. It's not, I see you for who you are. It's like, when I feel you, when I really feel you, when I really get you, it's because I feel you. Hmm. You've totally shifted my, my thinking now. I actually think the number one thing isn't being seen, it's being felt. It's being felt. Whoa. It's being felt. That really hit me. In fact, my, my husband, what he says to me is, you just want me to match your emotion. But actually, <laughs> it's not that I want him to just match it. I want him to feel the same way I do. Um, I don't know if you ever saw that scene. In, do you, did you ever watch Sex in the City? Yes. Okay, do you remember the scene towards the end where they have that apartment and Carrie and Aiden by the apartment next door? And the landlord says that she's not going to sell anymore. And so she gets really upset. And finally, Aiden gets upset too. And in that moment, she goes, thank you. Thank you for understanding me. Because the whole time he was really cool and she was all upset. And then finally, he matched her emotion. Mm -hmm. And so actually now I'm putting everything together. And he doesn't, he doesn't need to feel like you. Let's get even more well, like clear. Uh -huh. He doesn't need to feel like you. 
he just needs to feel what you feel with you. Mm. And then there's what he feels. That could be a completely different thing, right? So he can feel what he feels. And let's say he doesn't agree with you. But if he can feel with you what you feel mm. and make you feel felt, that changes everything. Oh, there's some nuance there. I still definitely want him to feel like me. I'm not going to lie. Well, we but, all want that. That doesn't mean you're going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. But this is so, wow, this is really like, I love these like, as Oprah calls it, right, the aha moments. This has just shifted a lot in my head. What other things can people do right now if they don't have the ability to, you know, do the, the Wisdom Academy? What can people do for them to really um, start to address either the past or to just step into the, I'm going to call it sensualness because I actually really love that that word. Um, how does someone step into that more? So for instance, and I'm just going to throw a few out there like clothes, right? How we dress, um, mm -hmm. I assume is also another echo, not just how we hold ourselves. There are many things that we can do. Many things. Here's a beautiful one. So you take cream, like a hand cream. I don't have hand cream with me on, a, on me. And you put hand cream and as you do, you start to, to move in your skin so that you're really taking pleasure in how it feels and like taking the time to kind of indulge and, and put it on rather than that being something that you're, I need to put creams on my hands. <laughs> yeah, like me this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah, check, 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 da, 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 da. Okay, what do we need to do? Mm. Like that could be a five minute thing that you really indulge in that sensuality and, and like feeling that you can even close your eyes and feel that. And as you're moving, just feeling the skin and kind of taking pleasure. And as you're doing that, you're allowing yourself to tap into your own beauty, into your sensuality, into, and that also links to self-worth. And here's a little tip I want to give that I think will, will touch so many people. Sometimes when I start to teach someone seduction, there's a real fear to go there. And someone says, but I don't want to go to a bar and I to do somebody. And here's my answer to that. That opens up everything. How about you don't need to go to a bar? How about learn to feel this for yourself? Just you at home. You don't need to go to any bar. You don't need to seduce somebody to learn seduction. Do it in front of the mirror. Do it in front of a poster of someone that you think is really hot, your you know, celebrity crush or whatnot. But learn it for yourself, for the self-confidence sake. If you want to use it one day some, in any other way, sure. But do it for yourself, for your own self-worth, for you to feel your power. When you own it, like you feel like you've got that power suddenly. And then the world is your oyster. You feel like you could go after what you want. That's the point. The rest of it is just like extra. Mm, I love that. We need to talk about this because we can't end the interview without just addressing because I want to make sure that people understand in the comments how we're thinking about it. So that I assume there are going to be people who are maybe a little triggered right now about the give it but don't really give it. It's not really a mm -hmm. no. It is kind of a yes. And so I just want to a respect where people are maybe coming from, but also orient what we're discussing and talking about. Obviously, with Me Too and anyone crossing a boundary is mm -hmm. unacceptable. Flat right. out. I, I actually think it's a really important thing to to bring up. Um, so uh, briefly, because it's an explosive thing and it's massive, but Me Too and sexual harassment have to be mentioned here. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to take it for a minute to, to where... Um, it's safe. Yeah. And it's safe where the, it's consensual. And it's consensual where the no or the maybe are because we really want it. But we're, we're playing a game to, to get the person to come after us. It's not when someone says no and they mean no. Mm -hmm. That's not a maybe that I need to turn into. That's a no. Uh, a, a maybe that, you know, that we could play with is when someone go, you know, looks at me and goes like, no. But there was already like, well, there's something maybe there. I'm just not ready to give it yet, right? That's a different conversation. So for when someone, when someone doesn't know and it becomes really complicated when we're not really showing, so nowadays we're so afraid of sexual harassment and me too and all these things that, that we're afraid to show. And then it becomes really hard to know and that becomes difficult and it's just muddy. But when you don't know, you can always try and then feel what's on the other side. Not just 
what is being said, the feel. Because when there's a no, you feel a no. You can feel it in your gut. You can feel it kind of tightening up. You can feel it in your stomach. You can feel when the person says no. That's just to be respected. And with elegance, not with shaming, not by saying something mean, not it doesn't mean anything about you. It's just to accept the no. We have to bring safety back. Because if there's no safety, there's no playing. And seduction is in the realm of playing. It's, it's flirty. It's fun. It's, there's playfulness in there. We can do that if it's not safe. And the scariest thing is that there's lack of elegance. Like in New York, you see this a lot. You come to a party and you'll stand there with your girlfriend and someone would try to seduce you. And then they'll look at you like they want to F you. Not like you're gorgeous, you're beautiful, like, oh, I want to do you, mm -hmm. which you feel disgusting. And then you're rejecting that. And five minutes later, they'll go to your friend and come on to her, and which was just so disrespectful. It lacks elegance because you're treating women like they are meat. And it's like, who gives you the right to do that? Excuse me. So there's a, a dialogue in, in, in what is going on in society that's getting distorted where it's unsafe to, to play and, and be seductive because it could be used against you. It could be, lines could be crossed. Like, and, and I can understand the fear of that. I'm explaining what it is when it works well, when it's pure, when it's good. Like with your husband, you've been together how many years? We've been together for 22, married for 20. Wow. Is there still seduction? Oh yeah, you better believe it. Hell yeah, exactly, <laughs> right? Hello. But also when you're meeting somebody, I was uh, today at the hotel where I'm staying, there was this, th these two young people, they looked like in their early 20s and they were so flirty, it was so cute. It was like they were doing the whole thing. It was like, oh really, you like that? And you can tell their personality, they're kind of, and I'm like, oh, that's adorable. You know, so when we're younger, it's easier because we're less jaded. When we get older, we get more afraid because we've gotten hurt already. We're a little more afraid to take risks. Again, healing the trauma underneath that. So um, learning to feel the situation, accepting and know when it's there, um, coming with elegance, and also understanding that it's awkward in the world. That's part of the game. You can ask, you can try, but be willing to accept what comes your way. And thank you for that. And if someone's coming to you, a clear no would be, thank you so much, but no. Like, how would you like make sure that they don't think that you're playing the game? The no has to feel like a no. This is the trick. So look at the difference. If I go like, yeah, thank you, but no. <laughs> that didn't feel like a no, I'm being nice. No, I feel but like as I'm being nice, now I gave the wrong impression that the person, so I'm like, I don't want to offend the person. But that thought gets you to say a no, that means a maybe. Because we're not, remember, what's stronger, actions speak louder than words. We're listening to the body more than the words. The way the person communicates through their body comes across to us. Is, so this is why sometimes someone says no, they meant no, but we're accepting a yes, right? That's yeah. where the, it happens. But if I come in and go like, thank you, that's very kind, but no. Right? I ain't fucking with you after that. <laughs> exactly, because I just gave such a no. You yeah. felt it with your mm -hmm. body, the no. I was still kind, I was still gracious, I said, you know, thank you very much. It's, you know, I can even say it's a nice compliment, but thank you, but no. What up, homie? I've got something free and new to share with you right now. How often are you visited by that negative voice in your head telling you that you're not smart enough, that you're not good enough, experienced enough, not fill in the blank? One of the most powerful things you can learn to do in life is to turn that negative voice into your bestie. And I want to teach you how to do that and so much more in my four steps to becoming confidence workshop. And guys, the most amazing thing is you can actually register for completely free for this workshop. So click the link on your screen and I'll see you on the inside. That's so important. Down. Yeah, thank you for that because I have two agendas almost. One is making sure that no one feels triggered, that we're being, you know, blind to the situation that sometimes people just ignore it and they just keep going, keep going. And they use it as like, well, you seem like you're interested versus flirting is beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I think flirting is important for relationships. And I would hate to see a world where flirting was eliminated. Right. And so making sure that we just have a very open conversation about. And we have to come back to trauma. We have to come back to trauma. Mm. Why? Because if my parents, for example, were always shutting me down whenever I wanted to say something, I wanted to say powerfully and was always shutting me down, then I might be pleasing. 
that I'm going to have such a hard time sitting in front of a person and speaking through my body to see a no that means no. And then I think like my boundaries are never respected. I can never like the world is not safe. No, you need to heal the trauma that happened. That's a trauma. Right. It's at the core of almost everything that we're talking about that's not working is trauma. 70 percent trauma in adults today. We have to take care of the trauma. There's the Wisdom Academy. There's coaching one on one. There's practitioner program. I even created a 17 dollar embodied femininity challenge for women because I really want to create a shift in the world. I took this journey and it was so tough to get to what I got to that I now want to have a range of things that there is something for everybody where we can get people to learn this wisdom and I'll, I'll keep creating and creating and creating till we get everybody what they need. Hell yeah. Where can people find that? Where can people find you? Yes. So one, when people want to come and hang out with me, I'm a lot on Instagram. That's my, my favorite place. <laughs> That's my place to hang out. Um, and we've got a beautiful... YouTube channel, five minutes, three minutes, like things that people can quickly digest and already start to learn from this. It's completely free. And then of course there's the SI, so it's SI for somatic intelligence, SIwisdomacademy.com and our main site, which is powerofsomaticintelligence.com where everything that we do is there. Keep watching to learn the truth about attraction and how to actually build desire. Someone is going on a date. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's like the first date, but they're like feeling the feels and they meet them and they feel the butterflies and they're like, oh my God, it feels like I've known this person for my entire life. You say run. I say run. I know. Isn't that crazy? Because butterflies, the kind that you're talking about, is actually the body's warning signal. And more often than not, when we feel like we've known someone in that way, I met him and it feels like I've, he feels so familiar to me or she feels like I've known her my whole life. Yeah, that's because they are embodying your wounds, right? So we're always gonna, until we heal ourselves, which most of us, let's face it, haven't done, you know, many of us are starting to now. Uh, if we haven't healed those wounds, then we are always going to get those butterflies and feel that deep recognition with someone who is going to play out those wounds with us. Always. We fall in lust at first sight. Mm -hmm. We don't fall in love at first sight. We fall in love at first insight, right? And it feels like, it feels like peace. Love does. Love feels like peace. And lust feels like excitement and, and you want both mm. in a good relationship but the butterflies and the intensity and like oh my god <laughs> that is wounds talking so talk to me then about the chemistry because to me it would seem like you would want chemistry yes. when you go on that first date so how do you differentiate between the signals your body's telling you between chemistry and butterflies because i would have before i looked into you would have put them in the same bucket. yeah well the butter i mean it's also where they are in your body right the butterflies are here that's anxiety. That's your body's warning system. The, um, you know, I joke with my husband, you know, when he does the dishes or does something that really turns me on, I always say, oh, my uterus just contracts. <laughs> but it's because that's really what it feels like. It feels mm. sexual excitement is more down here and up here, right? And emotional connection and excitement is in your heart. You know, my, my girlfriends joke about their vaginas clapping. You know, they're like, oh, he made my vagina clap. But you have that feeling. You have that feeling. And you also are objectively looking at that person and you say, wow, he or she or they are hot. Like, I find you attractive. And then you kiss them and especially smell them. And then you know if you're really physically, chemically attracted. And so many people forgo the chemical attraction because that person checks everything on their box and is such a great person that they don't really feel that chemistry. And it's so, that's what really sees you through, I think, the hard times. I love the way that you broke that down because it allows people to, when they go into a um, relationship, especially at the beginning, um, you know, we, we kind of, like to trust ourselves yeah. and we like to trust like, oh my heart, it's like it beats fast, that must mean that I like them. And so really where are those almost traps that we're putting ourselves in? Yes. Um, and so you mentioned it obviously is a reflection of past traumas. Yes. So talk to me about, I believe you call it love maps. 
Yeah, well, so when I talk about trauma, you know, there's big T trauma and little t trauma. We all have traumas. Times our boundaries weren't respected, times we were neglected, hypercriticized, abused to differing degrees, emotionally, physically, sexually, all three, God forbid, right? But we all have some degree of trauma, whether we have those big T traumas or not. And when, and, and they're almost like, um, I, I almost envision them, and many people who, who practice shamanic medicine say this too, that there, when every time we're traumatized in these really intimate ways, and I don't mean just sexually, I mean emotionally, and in terms of our connection to how worthy of love we are, mm -hmm. right? It's like a part of ourselves go into a little shock bubble and stay there, right? So when I'm looking at you, it's, or you're looking at me, you know, there's all of these little parts of you from all those times that Lisa was disregarded, rejected, all, any kind of traumas that you experience that are kind of stuck at that same point. Mm -hmm. And so what happens in our dating life is that, you know, let's just give a typical example and, and therapists, you know, call this repetition compulsion, but let's take a woman who was raised in a home where one or both parents had addiction. And she grows up and is like, I am never gonna marry, I'm not gonna marry anyone or even date anyone who has any history of addiction or shows any sign that he or she drinks too much or does, I don't even wanna be with someone who does drugs, like forget it, I'm not going anywhere near that. And gets those butterflies and feels that recognition and he doesn't drink and he doesn't do drugs or he has a few glasses of wine and nothing. Turns out he's a gambling addict, you know, down the line because we unconsciously smell that connection of our wound. Now here's the, what's underneath repetition compulsion. The reason it's compulsive is because we're unconscious of it. And what the unconscious wish is, is that this time I'm gonna get it right. Mm, yeah. I'm gonna resolve it. Yeah. You know, it's I'll be enough that the, the unconscious, the conscious is saying, oh, he doesn't drink, he doesn't do drugs. The unconscious saying, oh, goody, here's someone who I can feel addiction in. I know addiction really well. I bathed in it for 21 years, you know, in my childhood, mm -hmm. right? So I'm feeling this and sensing this, but this time I'm gonna be lovable enough and worthy enough that, the, that this person is gonna change for me. Ooh, so how on earth do you um, make your subconscious speak loudly so that you can actually see it or hear it so that you know when these things arise? Because to your point, it's like if you're not so aware or you have these tips, I can understand why. If you yeah. say, I'm not going to I'm not gonna be with someone with this and you talk to them, you ask them questions. Like, yes. Oh, so you don't drink, okay? Yeah, check. check. Right, yeah. yeah. Now, how on earth do you know when your subconscious then is trying to trick you into believing they're different. Because you have butterflies. Okay, so take me through it. So you have the butterflies. You have the butterflies and you're feeling this intensity that we mistake because of the movies and Hollywood mm -hmm. and everything else for love. It's lust, that's fine. You are attracted to this person, right? And you can ask them all the questions, but it's, it's two things. It's one, let's just put a pin in the first one, really recognizing that the only way you can create healthy love in your life is starts with you. you. The more healthy you are, the more healthy of a partner you're going to be a match for, mm -hmm. period. That's just always how it works. But also, just on a practical level, whether you've done that healing work or not, is to move slowly and consciously and to be what I call embodied. Because so often we get up here, we're already like walking down the aisle with that person or thinking about what our kids are going to look like, oh you know, on our first date. And we're getting all excited because we've gone on so many dud dates and there've been so many losers. And now I'm, you know, feeling all this intensity and you get rushed, you rush into it and you get carried away. If you were to move slowly and stay in your mm -hmm. body and be aware of those body signals, it doesn't mean that the minute you feel butterflies, you go running out the door and don't ever talk to that person again. But ding, 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 that's a red flag right? Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to sit with that for a minute and just be curious. I'm not going to run, but I'm also not going to run toward this, right? But here's a warning sign happening. What am I warning about? Because what I find is when people stay with themselves, even if they come back later, because you can't necessarily go in deep while you're, you know, sitting having drinks <laughs> no with way. someone you just met, but later, right? I teach people to just really ground, and I have all sorts of meditations that I guide people through, but I teach them to get really in their bodies, which most of us aren't, and feel what's there. And your body will literally, you can say to yourself, okay, when I think about this person, I'm feeling all this fluttering, all this mm. intensity, and you can ask it, like, what, what is this about? 
what is the first time I felt this? What, what do you want, right? And you will immediately get, oh, this is your dad, or this is your uncle, or, or you need to run, or this, there's something wrong, not right in this dynamic. And what we're taught to do in this society is to, is to work around our gut, not listen to it. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Um, so what happens then if you do these practices, right, and you really start to work on yourself? I think there's a phase where you almost, because of your past experiences, because you thought, oh, I trusted my gut and look where yeah, it ended up. Yeah, you yeah. broke my heart. I'm, you know, it took me a year to get over them. Yes. So now the opposite happens where no one's like, it's like, oh my God, I can't even trust yeah, anything. I'm not going to open up to anyone. Yeah. Right. Then you have to really address, there's two things. One is addressing the past trauma of that abandonment. And the only reason, you know, people always say, how come it's been three years and I still can't get over my ex? It's, it's not about your ex. It has nothing to do with your ex. It's that that ex is rejection and abandonment or cheating on you or whatever it was they did to you that destroyed the relationship is really familiar. It's a very old wound that happened to you long ago that this person triggered and that's why you're stuck there, right? So anytime you're stuck in resistance or in not being able to get over someone, it is rarely about them. My God, that is so true. So before I met my husband, I dated a guy for about three to four years. So it was like I had one long term relationship, had a break, and then I met my yeah. husband. And I remember every time we were together, it was torture. We argued all the time. He was a cruel person. He was emotionally abusive. And then every time we would split up, I would miss him. And mm -hmm. I would remind myself of all the wonderful times that we had. Um, and so in the, it never dawned on me, though, that there was the thing that I was missing. It wasn't him, right. but it was the emotion around the him. And it was also. I think, and this is just me guessing, I don't know the details of your childhood or history, but it was that longing to, it, the fantasy that I'm gonna be enough. I, if I could just be enough, if I could be more of something or less than something, then he wouldn't hurt me this way, mm -hmm. right? I get these weird senses when I talk to people, right? But I would say for you, the most conscious memory is probably when you were around five or six, when you first started getting this sense that you were, you were too much of something or not enough of something in order to be worthy of approval and love, acceptance and connection. A thousand percent. So I was teased, I was um, bullied at school, yeah. I was made fun of, the, the popular kids tricked me into this whole thing. And mm -hmm. so it's like I absolutely had utter insecurity, didn't feel worthy, um, and um, really did seek for validation. Yes. And I think that the second um, I met my ex-boyfriend was actually the moment where my um, unhealthy eating started mm -hmm. because I thought, oh, well, I'm developing as a woman. And now the one thing that I was was skinny. And so yes. now I wasn't skinny anymore. So then I started to worry that, oh my God, now I'm not gonna get- I don't have anything to offer. Yeah, so like I was seeking the validation in, in him. Yes. And what I love is that you're able to break that down. And so for someone listening right now, um, do you suggest they go back into the first seven years of their life and figure out what the wound, like how does yeah. someone well, start? Well, everyone's to trauma happens differently. For some people it happened in high school. For some people it was even pre-conscious. But it, for me, and this is really, the, honestly, the way my career has mm. evolved over the years. I, you know, my kids when they were little used to call me a talking doctor because I'm a talk therapist. But I actually do, I've become a talking doctor who is much more about communicate, you communicating with your own body. I'm much more somatic mm -hmm. than verbal mm -hmm. now in my work because I've learned not only in my own personal life, but in my professional life, that that is where trauma healing is found. What I find is that there are all these little parts of ourselves that we have just pushed mm -hmm. away and shoved into the dark basement and there's like monsters there and we don't wanna look there and it's, it's just like a basement filled with shame that I'm not enough, I'm not worthy enough, I'm not lovable enough, I, I'm, I'm just not lovable, I'm not worthy. And what happens is that you just obviously, you don't even wanna go there. But when you finally do, which often happens through the body and connect and really tuning into the sensations because the body is holding on to that, right? Mm -hmm. That's even what causes disease, it's dis-ease. It's the way our body is holding on to these past wounds. When you are willing to go in there and look at it, and it does take some bravery because that shit's been in the basement a long time. 
Once it's exposed to the light, it evaporates. There's so much of our shame that rules our life and that we carry because we're unwilling to look at it. And when we finally look at it with the consciousness we are now, mm -hmm. which is very different than that seven-year-old, 10-year-old, four-year-old, when we look at it now, we're like, no, that's not true. That's not true about you. That's not true about what happened. And all of a sudden it's like that. Once it's exposed to the light, shame almost always evaporates. Wow, um, I've never heard it. The, sh the basement of shame, that really hit me when you said that, because I think so many of us carry that with us and we don't want to admit it. We don't want, like you said, we're, it's like, I don't even have a basement, you pretend, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I have a no basement. basement. <laughs> um, so I think that that's super powerful. So is that where attachment styles come from? Is it mm -hmm. from the, the basement of shame that we haven't addressed? Yeah, Our, those early wounds. Um, I mean, I can tell you like with any attachment style, it, it started with the wounds of neglect, wounds of emotional abuse and hypercriticism, um, you know, wounds of, a of addiction, you know, for, for the child who was raised mm -hmm, by those people, mm -hmm. right? So someone who's got um, an avoidant person, avoidant attachment style would be more of someone who's a little, uh, would be, you know, coined more narcissistic acting, right? So their wounds are more around hypercriticism mm. and abandonment, but a lot of like, you're bad, you're wrong, you don't, you know, and, and the adults around you not being in control and not protecting you. So you have to kind of step in. The only one who can keep you safe is you. And, you, and in adulthood, that's still driving the bus. Well, wow, so how do you take, once you've assessed that, once you've assessed your trauma and you acknowledge where your attachment styles mm -hmm. are, how do you start to, I don't want to say unwind, but how do you start to maybe detach yourself from yeah. all of your past history and not as in ignore it or shove it under yeah, yeah. a rug, right? But actually work through it so that you can then begin to start having a um, successful relationship, whether you're just starting your relationship or yes. whether you're in the middle of your relationship. Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. I think, you know, I like to talk to the people that I teach and work with about this idea of like inviting your wounds to tea, you mm. know, having tea with them and making friends with them and, and wanting to understand them. Because once you do, when you come at it as the consciousness of the adult you are now, right, this one, mm you and you can look at and talk to those wounds you know inside yourself like you would a child or a best friend there's an integration that happens and there's also a um and a level of awareness that happens because once you've looked at it and you've put it on the table and you've interacted with it it's no longer in the basement mm -hmm. it's no longer in your unconscious mind you know it's it's the same thing that I almost do with people who have a lot of inhibitions, right, in the bedroom. And we will, we'll get into that later. But I'll often have them list all the things that they believe a nice girl or a good man or whatever that is do and don't do. In the bedroom. In the bedroom. Yeah. All the shoulds about that and shouldn'ts. And then in the next column, where did that message come? Like, where'd you get that story? <laughs> Oh, it was when my aunt caught me playing with myself and told me I was wrong, bad, or dirty, and I just always remembered that. Now it's outside of you, right? Now, which of these do you, as the adult you are now, still really believe about yourself and want to proactively subscribe to? Maybe three things on that list, right? So now every time that story comes up, and it's the same thing with shame, every time that story comes up, now it's in your conscious awareness. Now you're like, oh, there's that little cute, boo-boo from the basement coming up and making me want to, you know, yell at my partner right now or making me want to, you know, not really see this red flag. So you start to recognize once it's outside of you mm -hmm. and it's in front of you and you've had tea with it and you've had compassion for those parts of yourselves because it's always related to a strategy. You know, all of these wounds and the way we respond to them is how we survive our childhood. And they all have gifts, right? Like yeah. you were just saying before we shot that you're very, you know, you're OCD, right? You jokingly <laughs> call yourself OCD because you're making sure all the lights and the cameras and everything are all set. That's an amazing gift, right? That's an amazing gift that you are so on top of it and you're so detail oriented and you've got it all covered. That's the light, beautiful side of the gift. There's also a shadow and a wound underneath that gift.
Ooh. Right? And that's, that's the way it is with our wounds too. There's a beautiful gift. It's a strategy, right? It's probably a strategy that you adopted really early in a chaotic environment that somehow made you feel safe, that made you feel like you could control your environment and mm. calmed your nervous system down when you did things that, the few things you could do that made you feel in control of your environment. And so that's, that's the wound underneath it, but it's a beautiful gift. It's just that you want to call on the gift rather than have the gift just choose you. That's so freaking amazing. And I've heard you also talk about like, um, what do you actually want to feel? Yes, that's everything. Because how much of us, whether we're starting dating in the middle of a relationship, you're like, do they tick the boxes? Yes. Why right? do they have, do they earn a certain amount? Do they want children? Do they, you know, what religion are they? Yeah. Those are kind of like the yeah. boxes we normally tick. Yes. But I love that, you know, I've heard you say like, actually write down five feelings yes. you want from that person. That's all that matters. Honestly, anything you want, including in love, but anything you want to happen in your life or that you want to acquire or achieve, it is only because you want a certain feeling. That's it. The only reason you want that fancy house or fancy car is because how you imagine you're going to feel when you <laughs> have that thing. The only reason you want that kind of partner, whatever that description is, is because of how we want to feel. But we never start with the feelings. And the reason it's so important is because that's our internal motivation anyway. So you're cutting out all the crap and you're getting clear. But also, it turns out on an energetic level, we are creating our own reality mm -hmm. at all times. We are energetic beings. We are full atomic energy. And our energy, it's like a frequency that is constantly shifting and changing, and we're constantly matching each other, right? So you and I are doing what's called entrainment right now. So our frequencies are kind of finding a happy medium. In fact, you're probably entraining to me only because I'm consciously holding a frequency. Interesting, okay. And so our frequency is actually set by our feelings. Mm. So if you get clear on the, main, th you know, it's not the height, the job, the kids, the career. If you woke up every single day af next to the person of your dreams, how would you feel? Would you feel safe? Would you feel playful? Would you feel adventurous? Would you feel um, passionate? Would you feel connected? Mm. You know, what are the feelings you most want to feel in love? And then that becomes your compass for everything, not just dating. Every decision you make, and this is how I make New Year's resolutions, I make feeling resolutions, so that every decision I make, does this contribute to how I want to feel or not? And if not, no thank you. And that's amazing. Do you, um, do you suggest people then do that um, initially before going, like, let's say meeting somebody? Um, and then how often do you assess that? Because I, I think as you were talking, I was like, I don't know if my list would be the same when I first met my husband mm -hmm. compared to now. Yeah. So how do you know what partner to choose based on the fact that you're always going to grow? Or is it like things that you'll always want, like safety? Yes. At no point in your age do you go, ah, I don't care about yeah. the safety aspect anymore. Right. Yeah. And it's okay if it changes because who you are when you get together with someone may be very different than who you are 10 years from now. Yeah. Probably will be. How the two of you can grow together and evolve with those changes says everything about whether you're going to last or not, right? Mm -hmm. But you still can't get past, if you're looking for love right now, how you want to feel. You can't think about, you don't know who you're going to be 10 years right. from now to think about how you're going to feel, right? And all that is real is right now. I mean, God forbid, we, anything can happen anytime, right? Mm. So we don't know what's gonna happen an hour from now, much less 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. The only thing we know is real is this right here, right now. And so how do I wanna feel? Now, if I get clear, if I were looking for love and I were to say, you know, the three top feelings that I most wanna feel in love with my ideal partner is playful, connected, and romantic, right? I am now going to marinate in those feelings as much as possible. Not necessarily even in my dating life because I may not even have a date yet. Mm. But I'm gonna look for opportunities to feel connected. I'm gonna call in situations that make me feel uh, playful, right? And as you do that, 
that becomes your energetic frequency. And then you become a magnet, literally, to people and situations that match that feeling, that match that frequency, including romantic partners. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, in the way, well, the way that I like to teach this is two ways. One is to look for those opportunities, just to be in the energy of those feelings you most want to feel as much as possible. Amen. That's a really fun way to live, right? But also to move there in your imagination. So I even do this in my almost 20 year marriage to my husband. If I'm about to have a conversation with him that I know may be touchy for him, or I want him to show up a certain way in the relationship, I go there in my mind's eye, like I almost do a meditation. And you can do this before a date, even if you don't know who that person is and th they have no face, right? But here's the key to moving your body into the frequency of feelings if, through your imagination, is that the body and the brain don't know the difference between reality and rehearsal, okay? So when you are imagining, but you have to imagine in first person as if it's happening right here, right now. So you're not watching yourself. Okay. But you're in the scene, right? So you want to feel, un, you know, adventurous in your relationship. Let's just choose that feeling. In your mind's eye, you either think of a time that you felt unbelievably adventurous with someone and were having an amazing adventure, or you make up a fantasy in your mind of some future partner and you're climbing Mount Kilimanjaro or something, right? Whatever that is. But you are in the scene. You can see your feet, your hands. You're literally in that scene, in your mind. And you literally just sit there for five or 10 minutes imagining yourself in that scenario. And what is happening is your body is literally moving into the frequency hmm. of that sensation. And is that like, as you were talking, I was like, wow, that would be really powerful as a way for me to identify when I meet someone, if it kind of matches the sensation that I've, yes. I've created on my own. Yes, because you will repel people <laughs> who right. are not gonna match your frequency. Yeah, this literally, as you were talking, I was like, that's so freaking smart. And also I've heard you say, which is hilarious, but like, like the, you do not complete me. Like no, no. one completes you. No. Um, that movie sets us all up for disaster. Oh my God, that pisses um, me off so badly. <laughs> but is part of this then kind of the antidote to for people that wait for someone to complete them, where they're, vision, they're envisioning it because you're creating that emotion yourself. You're yes. not almost like waiting for someone else yes. to do it. And by the way, anytime you are sourcing your fulfillment outside yourself, you're gonna eventually fail. Mm. It is not sustainable to source your your the, your the feelings you most want to feel from outside yourself then you are always at the effect of other people and situations and then you're trying to control everything right. which is impossible it's yeah. impossible it's, i'll tell that to your little ocd self too like it's <laughs> impossible to control anything yeah, yeah the only thing we or anyone the only thing we can control is how we respond to things mm -hmm. right that's it and so when you spend time marinating in the energies of those feelings that you just want to live your life in, I'm not even talking about love, right? This mm -hmm. is the secret behind the secret. This is what's underneath manifesting, right? If I write myself a check for a million dollars, you know, and just put it on the table and say, why isn't a million dollars showing up? It's not going to show up. But if I am living in the frequency of the feeling that I would have mm. when I have that million mm. dollars in my pocket and it's here right now and I'm in the energy of that feeling, that's when manifestation happens. I love that because I'm all about having a North Star and making sure you know what that North Star yes. is. And so I've never really thought of it from a feeling. I've always thought of it from a goal, right. right? So it's like, I set a goal. Okay, the goal is to get the company to be at this point by this day. Okay, am I there? Yes or no. But I never thought about it from a feeling standpoint. Right. That's so beautiful. And then you add a whole new layer. I mean, obviously that's working for you, right? You've achieved a lot of goals, but it's achieving it through flow rather than force when mm, you do it this mm -hmm, way. And mm -hmm. it's adding huge momentum behind it. Yeah. So if you spend time as you're imagining, and when I achieve this goal, this, this, and this will happen. Okay, let me just tune in for a minute. Let me put myself in that situation in first person in my mind's eye. What do I feel in my body? What does that feel like? What, 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 how would I name that mm -hmm. feeling? Is it joy? Is it excitement? Is it peace? Is it, calm you know how am i going to feel when that goal is achieved and then that's what you want to cultivate 
That's so beautiful. I love that. The problem that I actually, as you were saying goals, the one thing that I found is it's never usually what you think it's going to be. No. Like people will look at even my relationship with my husband and it's like, oh my God, you're so lucky. And you, you know, it's like, you know how freaking hard work it is? <laughs> like, so me and my husband, we joke about like yes. how exhausting it is. It's, it's a whole other business. It is. And so people, I think, see long-term successful marriages and have a understanding of how they think it will feel and so the truth is, is that it's never going to be like, I talk about phases, right? Relationship yes. has its phases. You do a scan of someone that's just met someone for the first time and the intoxication, it looks like they were on cocaine. Yes, that's, it, literally their brain is responding like it's on cocaine. When they look at people's brains, when they're in a brand new, and it's called the infatuation stage, mm -hmm. can't get enough of each other. Your brain, the dopamine centers of your brain are firing like crazy, which is the same addiction center that gets you addicted to coke or anything else. Yeah, and so that's fascinating to me because it also makes me understand why people do stay in relationships probably longer yeah. than they should because yeah. they're trying to get it back. Back, yes. Um, and actually, I have a quote of yours about relationships and people being in them too long because I think the intoxication part of it and the chemistry part mm -hmm. of it and then the want of wanting to feel a certain yes. way, um, even when you don't get it, there's multiple things. There's one that you, like people say, they're pot committed if you play poker, right? Yeah, yeah. Where it's like, well, I've spent six years with yeah, this person. Yeah, yeah. I can't just leave now. I want to start over. I don't want to start over. And then you've got another quote of yours where it says, the pain of being in the relationship has to be greater than your fear of leaving Always. it. Always. Always. Or you're not going to leave. Nope. Dude, that was so strong. That's, it's so true. When you are staying in a relationship out of fear, which let's face it, 99% of those relationships that we really should be leaving, that we stay in, we're yeah. staying out of fear of consequences, financial fears, fear about the kids, fear there won't be anyone better, fear I won't find anyone better, fear I've lost too much time. I mean, you, name your poison, right? There are a million different fears. What has to happen in those cases from, you know, is either you address those fears, which let's face it, most of us don't do, mm -hmm. right? Or eventually, and it always gets there, eventually the pain of being in that stuck place becomes greater than those fears that are keeping you stuck. How many people waste their time though, between that, like, where they're kind of new? Yeah. And it becomes like you try, but those years that you're trying really like, in fact, how do you bypass spending those years yeah. where you get to the point where it's like, all right, now it's just too bad I have yeah. to leave versus yeah. like you, you just spent two years on something that you kind of knew from the get go. You know, I'm I'm a big believer that in divine timing and I know there are often regrets when people finally leave and they're like, mm. why the frick did I waste so much time? Right. But once they get over that they do learn a lot of really important soul lessons from that time, right? So yeah, I would like everyone to get out when the getting's good and not wait too long. But here's the cool thing, and this is something I dis discovered basically with quantum love, is that I had always been, a, and still am a couples therapist, but like most couples therapists, I ideally had both partners in the room with me. And if one of them didn't want to come or wasn't ready to come, a lot of our work with the other one was getting that person in the door mm -hmm. or doing as much as I could indirectly since they wouldn't come in. What I have found with working with the energy and the feelings and moving yourself into the frequency of those intentions for your relationship is that I can actually help change the relationship with just one of you because when you change what's going on inside you, you have to be ready because everything around you will change. And what, and this is what happens when you start practicing this in a love relationship that isn't working for you. Either you're doing your work and you're raising your frequency and you're clearing the stuff that's in the way, the higher your frequency is, the better your life is gonna go. So anything from living primarily in curiosity, optimism, excitement, joy, um, forgiveness, those are all high frequency energies that are gonna create much more. Shame, anger, fear, guilt and shame. Shame is the lowest, then guilt frequency, right? That's gonna create more of that. So that when you start working just individually and living in those higher frequencies, what I call home frequency, first, your life gets so much better in all aspects. In your relationship, your partner 
and it's it's amazing to me in love relationships we are we are what they call quantum entangled our atoms are literally entangled they've been able to show that couples heart rates synchronize even when they aren't sleeping in the same bed <laughs> and you know there was a university of washington study where they took a couple and when they shined a light in the eye of one the ocular receptors in the brain of the other lit up like we're so oh. we're so entwined that what happens is as you raise and hold a certain frequency, your partner literally entrains to you automatically. And so it's like a Jedi mind trick for your relationship. <laughs> it is crazy. And so often in our love relationships where our partner isn't showing up the way we want, the relationship will just naturally disintegrate. Mm. It will no longer feel so scary and painful because now you are living in a different place. You are stronger. You've done all this healing. So the fears that kept you in that relationship fall away. And now you're in choice in your relationship. And that is everything. Because if you're not in choice, you can't ever get your needs met. If, if you're not going to be okay and whole, not that you wouldn't be devastated if that relationship ended and maybe curl up in a ball for a while and be scared, but you know fundamentally you'll be okay and that your happiness and your peace and your joy and the ways you want to feel is sourced in your relationship with yourself. And anytime we're having a relationship with someone else, we really are only having a relationship with ourselves through that other person <laughs> anyway, right? When you recognize all of that and you can create your own happiness, right? I want to be with you. It's a choice. And if I can't get my needs met, I can leave. Ooh, that was so powerful. Okay, there's a couple of things that you just said that I really want to go into. Um, I'm a bit of a skeptic, mm -hmm. um, but everything you just said makes so much sense to me. And the reason why, and I, again, it's one of these, like I, I personally can't even explain it and, yeah. and you do such a great job. But like when you're around, um, let's say five of your friends and you're with each other all the time, yeah. the fact that your, your hormones sync up and your yes. periods sync up, yes. like I wouldn't have believed it. Yes. And so understanding how you become on the same frequency as your partner, like actually you laid it out so beautifully. And then there was a other piece that I thought, oh, when you start stepping into that, I think you start acting differently as well, mm -hmm. right? So you start setting boundaries that maybe once upon a time you didn't. Absolutely. Any boundary you don't set is out of fear. Fear of consequences, fear of abandonment, fear of judgment. Mm. Um, and we're not even always conscious of those fears, right. right? But yeah, absolutely. Everything changes for the better. So whether whatever happens in the relationship, your whole life is going to get better. But here's, you know, I when I wrote this book, I wrote it with my husband in mind, who I jokingly call Senor Root Chakra, because he is so pragmatic <laughs> and such a skeptic. So like I have a whole chapter in there that is just laying out the science. But, you know, and I don't mind skeptics. I was a skeptic before I really understood this too. But here's the fundamental truth that we know for a fact. We are taking in 40 billion bits of information into our brains every millisecond. But we are only consciously processing, consciously processing 2,000 bits. Wow. of the 40 billion bits wow. of information we're taking in. So we just then taken in the things that are familiar to us? Well, the or way our conscious brain works, it's called an envelope mechanism. We can only understand things and make sense of things based on our memories. Right. So, so that's all we can process consciously. Right. And we can also, we're also limited by our five senses, right? But there's a whole universe happening around us that, and in us and between us that we have no clue about because we're limited by our conscious minds and our five senses. Yeah, wow, that's so true, I love that. The, I mean, it's funny how you like, we're limited by it, you're right. Um, and isn't it though, I think women have like a, a, is it a fourth or a fifth a color receptor that most men don't? And we also have more connection between our left and right hemispheres. We have a lot of interaction there. So that's why women can be multitasking, we are a lot more intuitive. Uh, we are more capable of those more psychic sixth sense mm -hmm. understandings than many men are. Not that men aren't, but we just have that natural ability. All right. So let's talk about the difference between genders. I know it's, it's a little of a bit of a muddly situation yes. discussion right now, but um, I really want to talk about it. 
because I do think there's a fundamental difference between um, at least me and my husband. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to say that. Me and my husband. There's a massive fundamental difference between us. And the thing that we say a lot, and I've heard you say, and I'd really love to just have a really beautiful, honest conversation about it. Women want to feel loved to have sex. Men want sex to feel loved. Yes. It is one of the most controversial things me and my husband have ever spoken about. Um, and so I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. And I don't, you know, it's partly in their, in men's DNA and how they evolved, you know, during caveman times and, and the desire to spread your seed and all of those, you know, DNA type impulses, right? It's also because of the way they've been socialized and everything else. So for women, women, uh, we feel clo emotional closeness, emotional intimacy through sharing, connecting, spending time together, you know, for some of us cuddling, you know, physical affection, right? But men achieve that same sense of emotional closeness. Primarily, their primary vehicle is through the physical act of sex. Mm. So what happens is, and this is what the, I, you know, I did national research years ago on what the most sexually satisfied women have in common. Ooh. And the cool part and interesting part to me is that it wasn't how many orgasms they had or anything else about the technique of the partner. It was the emotional closeness they felt to the person they just had sex with that most predicted for their sexual satisfaction above and beyond anything mm. else. And it is also the thing that inspires women, especially in a long-term relationship after you get through that infatuation stage, right? When you move into what scientists call the attachment phase. Um, your desire to be sexual, the myth is that it comes from spontaneous horniness, like it did in the beginning of the relationship. Most women in a long-term relationship, for many different reasons we can get into, don't have a ton, they do have it, but they don't have a ton of spontaneous horniness. They are inspired and they don't, they don't know to access this, but they are inspired to be sexual from a feeling of I'm close with, I wanna connect with you, I love you, I feel connected to you, I wanna show you my love in a way that lands, I wanna even merge closer to you, I wanna feel held by you, I want you inside, you know, whatever that is. But it's coming from an, a sense of connection mm. at its core. And so what happens is once a woman loses interest in sex, cause she's not spontaneously horny, and she's busy and she's distracted and she just doesn't have that natural impulse to be sexual and that's not what makes her feel connected to her partner anyway she's less available for sex and then he because he's not having sex with her doesn't feel that emotional connection and closeness so he unconsciously it's not like he's intending to punish her he right. unconsciously pulls back he's less likely to be romantic and send those sweet texts and cuddle and reach out to her in those emotional ways that make her feel close to him and then because she doesn't feel close to him she's that much less inspired to be sexual with him so that's the sex romance stalemate yeah. right she's not having sex with him he's less romantic and connected he's less romantic and connected she doesn't want to have sex with him and so on and so forth. You just explained it so perfectly <laughs> because that's the thing. It's like um, w we had an interview. It was with Sting, and he would, yeah. someone said like, "What's what's the the magic to your relationship?" And he said something like, "Well, I have to sex for twelve hours." Mm -hmm. Now, what he actually meant, and then that rumor went around. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, he does this tantric mm -hmm. sex for twelve hours. Mm -hmm. He's like, guys, I don't actually have sex for twelve hours, but my sex with my wife starts in the morning when yes. I kiss her yes. good morning. It's when I tell her at 10 a.m. that she looks beautiful. Yes. It's at 11 when I make her a hot tea. You know, he's like, that's what the sex is for my yes. wife. She needs the 12 hours so that we can get to the last, you know, 30 minutes or yes. whatever. That's what I always say. Men, women are like a slow burning stove. Men are like a microwave oven, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so you got to stoke the flames mm. all the time so that she's feeling that connection and foreplay. I mean, that's, there was a, several studies done, I, which does makes total sense to me that men who do housework in a real, you know, in a couple get significantly more sex than men who don't. And that's really for two reasons. First, cause he's taking stuff off her plate that she gets too stressed about and then doesn't want to have sex because mm. she's got to clean. But also more importantly, that's a form of love because mm. he's showing her that he's invested in the nest 
and he wants to help mm -hmm. and he's taking things off her plate and she feels cared for and seen and partnered with and allied with and close to him and then wants to have sex with him. Oh, that's so beautiful because it's beautiful to the way you've broken it down because you know, we've really spoken in this interview, it's like when you first meet someone, what are the, the, the tips and the, the how do we set each other up for success in order to have a long-term relationship. And then I think about long-term relationships. Mm -hmm. And when I was younger, I would see couples that had been married for a long time. And I would hear women that would say, he's not romantic, you know, basically would spend an hour moaning and mm -hmm. complaining about mm -hmm. what their partner isn't doing. And then in that same breath, they're like, yeah, and it's his birthday today, so I've got to give it up. And like as a kid, I remember, not as a kid, but yeah. I mean, no, as a kid, I remember thinking like, that feels counterintuitive. Yeah. It's saying that you want something from them, but yet at the same time, you're passing judgment on what they want. Yes. And so that never sat well with me. And then as I got older and I started to do these interviews and talking with you, it's like there's a big gap between like how when you first meet someone, there's this immense infatuation. And like you were saying at the beginning, right, yeah. the butterflies, yeah. oh my God, this was meant to be. I've yes. known them my whole life. And then you flash forward 10, 15 years and you end up in this situation. Yes. Um, and where along the lines are those traps in relationships that we fall into? And so you, the way that you broke it down is beautiful because I used to hear women judge men. Yeah. Or their partners on wanting to be intimate. Yeah, and that hurt, that breaks my heart because mm -hmm. I try to explain to women that he is he's not trying to punish you. You know, she'll say to him, "Why aren't you romantic anymore?" Well, you know, if he's at all aware, he might say, "Well, we haven't had sex in six months or yeah. three months," and then she says, "Oh, you're only going to be nice to me if I." Have... She doesn't understand that her not being sexually available for a man who has a healthy libido is like him being unwilling to ask you about your day or hold your hand. Oh. Like that's what it feels like. The the level of rejection and disconnect. And and it's big. It's really big. And I don't think women and the other thing that I think puts us in this position as women is that most of us were never allowed by society or our families or encouraged to develop our own relationship with our sexuality. Mm. So sex from the very beginning was transactional which it's not supposed to be. So sex was a way to get the guy, a way to keep them, a way to get a ring on it, a way to have a baby, a way to keep them from going over there, a way, a way, a way, a way to get them to be nice to me. The honey-do list, right? Like he'll do the honey-do list once I have, you know, it's a transaction, mm. but they don't have their own relationship with their own bodies and their own sexuality for its own sake, which men do, which is why they need it and want it. And also all those other DNA reasons, but, but women don't. So a lot of the healing that needs to happen with, I find, with women stuck in this sex romance stalemate, you know, is obviously there's the medical things, hormones, medications, things that inhibit your response and your mm. libido that I never want to ignore and relationship dynamics. But a huge part of it is your own relationship with your sexuality for its own sake. Because once you have that, then there's much more mm. connection, right? This I remember this rabbi telling this joke that if you put a jelly bean in a jar for every time you have sex before you get married and you take one out for every time you have sex after you get married, you're gonna end up with a big jar of jelly beans at the end, <laughs> right? And the reason for that is- Oh, that's heartbreaking. That's why men complain. Once, we, once you put a ring on a dude, you won't get laid ever. The reason for that is because you have married someone like 99% of women in this country who, for whom sex is unconsciously transactional. Oh, wow, God, that really hit me hard. Like, because I hear you like a currency, right? You're kind of yeah. using it as a way to get what you want. Yes. And so are you saying by examining yourself, by examining like what you actually like, it now no longer becomes a, well, what am I going to get from it? It's just like, this freaking feels this amazing. Feels amazing. <laughs> this, is, this is the most sacred, amazing gift that we are given our sexuality. There's, there, and the connection that that creates in your relationship is indescribable and irreplaceable. And, but even separate from your relationship, the relationship it gives you with your body, what it does to your body, the health benefits of it. And by the way, it's the highest frequency experience. It's major mass manifesting energy. Mm -hmm. It's that bliss, orgasm is that bliss energy that most of us don't spend a lot of time in unless we're Dalai Lama up on a mountaintop, right? So that's an opportunity to really experience physical bliss. So how do you start to unwind that past? Because 
to your point, I mean, I was told the same. It's like, yeah. it wasn't that it was bad or I was going to, you know, go to hell. Like, it was never that intense. Which I know some people do yes, have yes. hear that. Um, but for me, it was just, it was never discussed. It right. was never um, a topic. It was never encouraged. Right, um, which is a message in itself. Yeah. Silence is a message. Right. So how do you now, assuming that most people listening are hopefully adults, um, how would you suggest someone that is like listening to start exploring their body, to start, because yeah. to your point, I think you said, is it 30% of couples end up with bed, uh, bed death? Yeah, more than that. I would say that um, there there is a stat that at least 40% of couples ha ha by their own, I mean, this is just the couples that report it, have sexless marriages. Yeah. Um, and even those relationships where women are having sex, they often aren't that into it. They're doing it just to kind of mm -hmm. maintain mm -hmm. things. They're kind of either faking orgasms. So, you know, I, I can't tell you how many men have told me that she's, like, I've even heard stories where men have told me, and their partner sitting right there and she admits it, you know, that she says, wake me up when it's over or don't leave me in the wet spot or just like get it over with. Oh. So it's like this physical release that he just needs to do. And, you know, that's it. Yeah. And um, and, and that's because she's not she doesn't have her own relationship with herself. So the way I think I think every woman. Um, and I gave you a little toy before. So yeah, you you it. Honestly, come on now. Don't, guys, do I not have the best freaking job ever? She comes with <laughs> sex toys. This is like literally the best job but ever. But that's the thing. You have to practice. You have to really get into the experience through self-stimulation and self-reverence and self-exploration of really claiming your own sexual experience mm. for, by, and with yourself. And what happens for a lot of women is that they learn a lot during that time about how they like to be touched and don't like to be touched and what feels good and what doesn't feel good and whatever else. But for many women who may already know that, but still have had this transactional connection, mm -hmm. which I would say is almost all women, um, they going through the process of really having sex with yourself mm -hmm. in a loving, reverent way for no purpose other than pleasure and self-connection, it's like a, a, a skill set and a, and, a, and a capacity that is inside all of us that just needs to be awakened. I a thousand percent agree. Is there like that first, there's someone that already, that sees it as shame or sees yeah. it as like, oh, I wouldn't do that or, you know, almost like dismisses it because yeah. what you're saying is so freaking powerful that I'm thinking about the person that doesn't quite believe it yet or yeah. wants to, really wants to, but it has so many years tied up of, um, you shouldn't. Don't you, touch yourself. Yeah. Right? Well, I mean, first of all, if you don't love your genitals, how can you expect anyone else to? Hmm. Like seriously, I'm telling you, self-stimulation is the key to your pleasure. It's the key to your power. It's the key to your sexual power. It's the key to your ability to get aroused. And it's the key to your libido. Because first of all, where attention goes, energy flows. And if you don't use it, you lose it. You really do. Physically, you got to keep the plumbing clean. You got to keep the blood flow going. Mm. So if you're, you know, even if you aren't having sex with your partner for some reason, if you can continually self-stimulate, you are, it's so good for your health. It's so good for your immune system, for your blood pressure, for depression, for migraines, for your immune system. And there's so many benefits to sexual pleasure with a partner or without. That was like the best ad for masturbation. <laughs> and thank you for saying that. And the reason why I really want to talk about this, like I used to be the one, I wouldn't even say the word sex. That's how bashful <laughs> I was. So I need people yeah. to know that who they see today and being able to talk about it has because I've gone through my own yes. evolution. And I was the one that was told it's for the guy, right? So right. when the, my first boyfriend who I, you know, lost my virginity to, it was for him. Yes. I didn't freaking enjoy it at all until I met my husband. Right. And it was because I felt safe. He encouraged me. He um, he was patient. He was patient. He welcomed it. He and so like all these things, I didn't feel the pressure. I felt mm -hmm. like the the idea and the notion of I'd be judged for it. He kind of like really did help break that down, um, and then just in that evolution allowed us to be a very honest with each other. And I yes. think that that's a big part. You actually said the mismatched libidos. How many people don't even talk about no, the fact that they're they mismatched? No, they don't talk about it. And then he, you know, the one with the higher libido, men often, especially nowadays, are struggling with low libido. I think about one in five men have low libido. Mm -hmm. But it's usually the female. And 
you know, if you think about it, our bodies still haven't caught up, evolved with modern technology. Mm -hmm. You know, our bodies haven't, we're not supposed to live past our reproductive years. Several hundred years ago, that's what we died, you know, 50 was like the equivalent of 85 mm -hmm. today, right? So to live half of our lives beyond our hormonal ideal, right? A woman in her, who's in her 20s has twice the testosterone that a woman in her 60s has, that hormone of desire and sexual response. So it's slowly declining and we're living such a long time so that the, the, even the physiologic underpinnings of a healthy libido starts to disintegrate as we get older. And so, I mean, that's a whole other conversation about hormone therapy that I'm, you know, I'm a, like I say, I'm not an MD, but, but the thing to remember is that when we're young, for many of us, sex is easy. When we're in a new relationship, for many of us, sex is easy. It's about sourcing your sexual desire from your own relationship with your sexuality and expressing that, and from a desire to express closeness, connection, and love with your partner. And what I hear from women all the time who have low libido is like, yeah, I would rather be watching Bridgerton. I'd rather be doing more things on my to-do list. Mm -hmm. But once I do it, I think, hey, this was fun. I should do this more often. But I just don't, right? So what is that then? That little thing that so once it's kind of like going to a party where you're like, I really yeah. can't be bothered to go. And then you go and you actually have fun. Right, right. But the Same next time thing. you really don't want to get dressed again to yes. go to the party. Yes. Or go to the gym, right? But but it's a habit and it's a practice. Okay. And it's also mm. about the rewards it reaps. Mm. And then it kind of sex begets more sex. I find that once couples start, mm. and, and, and it often, you know, I'm a huge fan, even though it doesn't match the Hollywood movie a depiction of, of sexual relationships, I am a huge fan of scheduling sex, huge. Because it takes all the guesswork out, you know, because what happens when you're not having sex is the one that still wants it is scared to kiss or cuddle mm -hmm. you because you might think they're trying to start something and they don't want to be rejected or you won't reach out to them. If, like there's all, the, there's an 800 pound gorilla in the room with you, right? Yes. So if you know that on Saturday, you know, it can be different times every week or the same, every couple's different that's when we're going to have sex then there's all this openness and and freedom to connect and to play and to be affectionate and to stoke that stove right and then you know you're prepared for it and, i love that and so then much. you're ready and you have sex and then you're like hey this was fun and then it creates less guesswork the 800 pound gorilla can leave the room and then there's so much more freedom and the other thing i like couples to do in between their sex dates is to make sure that they spend you know at least an hour it can be split up a week kissing cuddling no sex kissing cuddling talking without technology and not about the logistics of their lives. Mm. And most couples don't talk more than, they talk maximum 15 minutes a week about things other than the logistics of their lives. And that's, you know, they'll talk a lot about the logistics, but 15 minutes max. And they're not spending time together because they're sitting next to each other with their technology. So, and they're not kissing and cuddling and being affectionate because one of them doesn't want sex and it's all mm. awkward. So once you kind of create this, what I find happens, especially because women, including those women with low desire, they really miss that non-sexual physical affection. They love making out, they love cuddling, but they won't initiate it because they don't want him to get too excited because they don't want to have sex. But once sex is off the table, except that time, then there's all this freedom to get all into it and have fun. And boy, is your stove stoked. God, it's so true. Everything you just said, I was like, oh my God, it's the things that we don't really talk about. It's the things that we kind of ignore. Mm -hmm. um, me and my husband, absolutely. We don't call it like a sex date, but we we absolutely schedule dates. And mm -hmm. that's the only time that we can both switch off. Mm -hmm. And then of 99.999% of the time, it ends in sex. So we do know that. And then we've started to as well... Um, spend the morning of our date getting ready yes. for sex. Yes. So it's kind of like, sometimes, you know, it's like, I'll, I'll trim his like chest hair. Yeah, or you'll you shave know. your oh, legs. Yeah, yes. and so, but we do it together. Yeah. And he'll even come and just keep me company if I'm shaving my legs. Aww. Because now it feels like we're actually spending it's time together. Play. And it's foreplay, yeah. And then the other thing that me and my husband do, we have a rule. Um, I'll never, ever, ever make him feel guilty for asking for sex. Good. And he can never, ever, ever make me feel guilty for saying no. Good. And those are just like, and it, it became like this beautiful, like, ah. Oh. 
Yeah, that's the weight so is much lifted. pressure off. Because to your point, where the woman's like, I just want to cuddle, but I'm so freaking scared that if I cuddle him, he's going to want, he's going to be turned on. Yeah, yeah. And then you have to be able, and with the sex dates, it also has to be okay to say no. Like, let's say you're really not feeling well, or but you really don't want, like, that's the last mm. resort. And if you do say no on a sex date, you are responsible for rescheduling it as quickly as possible. You know, you don't wait another week and you and you get it in there because at a bare minimum, what I want to see healthy couples is at least once a week and ideally never going more than a few weeks with that deep physical connection. Click here right now to take back your power, learn the signs that he's wasting your time and he's just using you. Women's believing in, the, you know, the man should pursue for those who are spiritual, they'll use the scripture, he who finds a wife. And so they're, they're gauging who should they give their interest to.